Hello so folks, welcome to a new video. It seems that one of the Guardian writers might actually be finally getting it. Um, she's Her name's Anne McElvoy and she's starting to get why the Labour lost in 2017 as well as this year and why the Remain campaign lost. Just a, just a little just a little sliver of hope maybe that Labour can be saved by the centrists, the very few centrists that are left in the party. But I'll start the article. How miserable are you feeling as you contemplate 2020? Putting aside our individual circumstances, the answer is often closely linked to how we are minded politically. A series of body blows to centrist thinking since the honeymoon period after the Cold War gave way to a financial crisis and bitter backwash, followed by the arrival of Donald Trump and a gaggle of nationalist populists around the globe. Add a resounding ma majority for Boris Johnson at home, midwife in a Brexit on untrammeled terms, and liberal grumpiness as its reasons. Yes, it does. It, I'll go into a bit further before I comment much on it. But it feels like the right moment to ask whether the gloom-deploying strategy has been so smart. A far-left Labour Party served up a recipe of predictions of disaster to dim the fairy lights of the holiday season and suffered a calamity at the polls. More broadly, Liberals, and not just the Lib Dem kind, need to think how unattractively miserable they have become and what they might do about it. And yeah, I don't think that was a massive part of this election like obviously Boris is a very positive guy so it would have helped it would have won him a few votes but if we go back to the EU referendum that attitude is what lost Remain it that is honestly what it lost and ever since it's why they've lost the argument because they can't find you ask a lever you can you can you could probably get them to see a decent reason for remaining but if you ask a Remainer, well, a hardcore Remainer, if they can find a decent reason for leaving, and they won't. They will say it's all doom and gloom. Every, every road of Brexit leads to doom and death and everybody's going to be without clean drinking water and all that nonsense. Um, one key reason Johnson has prevailed in his ambition and direction, this being linked to with a less attractive character trait, namely recklessness. But here is a politician who has carefully exploited Barnum-esque mo moments to emphasise that he is different from the dreary run of his peers. Some people deem what that innately hilarious, others find the antics and confection of his speeches wearing a man-child in leader's clothing. Still, it would require a political tin ear not to heed his appeal to parts of the country that rejected his forebears with such gusto. And yeah, Boris is fallible. That's why we like him. Because we're fallible. We make mistakes. Boris makes mistakes. Um, he doesn't care. He owns that shit. He doesn't try to hide it. He doesn't... He doesn't try to pass the book on to somebody else. He, he eats the blame when it's when it's his fault. He will eat the blame, and that's what we just want some honesty. That is all we're tired of being lied to. This, uh, you might think Boris is a bit of a liar, but if he fucks up, he's going to own it. He will tell he will tell the country that he fucked up, and he's going to try and fix it whatever way. But many other politicians wouldn't. They would find a reason. They would find a way to blame somebody else for it. Northwest Durham, where I grew up, and nearby Bishop Auckland, which has acquired Ashen Court significance for victorious Conservatives, are two such fiefs. They switched political course in large part because they were fed up with waiting for the Brexit moment to come, and because of the not unreasonable view that if you felt left behind in an area where for decades the only language has been Labour, it makes sense to change the language. Hell yes, my area is full of places like this. My constituency went... Tory in 2017 after 102 years of being Labour and then either side of me I've got Ashfield and Bolsover. Uh, Ashfield didn't go last time, Bolsover didn't go last time but in 2019 they both went Tory. Dennis Skinner lost Bolsover after 49 years of being their MP. So yeah this is that is a, a very good um, example because we have voted Labour for as long as I can remember and I didn't think we'd ever change that. And I don't think any other Tory could have changed that. Except Boris. For some reason. he just, Because he's fallible. And because he is probably the most liberal Tory there is. That's that's why Boris Johnson won this election. Because he's something that no other Tory could offer. I, I don't think they'd have. If you'd have got Sajid Javid in as the leader. Or, or Jeremy Hunt. I'm not sure they'd have won these Midlands seats. But Boris Johnson. Hell yeah. Um, 
A stalwart Labour voting friend in the Durham constituency told me a couple of weeks before the election that he kept encountering people who were considering switching intentions because Johnson was someone you could sit down and have a beer for a beer and have a laugh with. And yeah, you could. I, I fully agree with that. Like I say, he's, it, it, he's fallible, so we can relate to that because we've all made mistakes in our lives. And we can see that Boris has made some mistakes in our lives and he just laughs them all off. He, he doesn't care. Back in the enclosed political drawing room of Romani Central London, the denunciations of his moral turpitude were a repeated theme. I wish he would just go away, snap one acquaintance, acquaintance pointlessly as it turned out. Reality check, it was Anna Subra's Indi independent group for change that shut up shop at the end of 2019. When I email a prominent Tory defector to the Lib Dems to ask what comes next, he replies simply, time to do something else. Now that's got to be Philip Lee for a guess, um, I think he was the only male Tory that went over to the Lib Dem so yeah he's got to find himself another job that's that's what I like to hear I hope Anna Subra is doing the same although I have seen her on LBC this morning I think it was bloody hell uh, sands today shift extremely fast and perceptions can differ widely even before we reach the extremes of politics where Johnson's critics saw egregious moral weakness, an on-off relationship with the truth, and a th threadbare promise to deliver more spending while dealing with the economic and logistical challenges of leaving the EU, a lot of other people disagree. As one of his cabinet puts it, Boris is a personal Rorschach test, in which the ink blot takes on multiple meanings. That's true, everybody's got a different, different opinion of what Boris actually is. Um, I, I think he's the most liberal Tory that there's ever been, but there'll be plenty of different opinions on him. Enthusiasm, if even if misdirected, is more alluring than a bearing a grudge about someone else's vision. Yet the tentacles of pessimism have spread much more broadly among liberals, who traditionally believed in harnessing the best of human endeavour. Liberalism acknowledges, and acknowledges the continuing fight of individ individuals and society against overweening power or obscuritanism, but it also needs determination and flexibility. And you need to not, you need to not be racist. At the end of the day, like there, we are, we are a white country. At the end of the day, and everything I hear nowadays from Labour is anti-white. Your old pale and stale, which is weird considering that they had Jeremy Corbyn as leader for four years and so it's a baffling one that is but you you need to start treating the white working class better we are not second class we, we're being treated as second class citizens in our own country at the moment that's it's got to stop that we treat the whole working class the same whatever color of skin like Labour keep making this I keep running into people from Labour that make this argument that um, Labour would work, look after the whole of the working class, but they don't. They, I, I, so many times I've heard the line, pale, male and stale. Uh, how are you endearing yourself to, at the last census, I know it's probably not going to be the same at the next one, but at the last census, 85% of British population is white. It's just, you're not, you're not going to win them votes. Stop being so bloody silly. Does the language of centrist progressives still say this with any gusto, or is it locked into predicting disasters? The overuse of catastrophic to describe a range of Brexit outcomes is followed by a new contender in the cliché charts, deeply troubling, in which the deeply bit means something happened that one had not predicted and is thus confused about. Exactly. Project Fear. We lived with it for the entire referendum campaign and for three years after it seems to have died down a little bit now but yes you really need to learn from that if the bbc gets unfairly into hot waters on charges of skewed impartiality i might suggest to commissioners including my beloved bosses at radio 4 that the tone and range of ideas can tip too easily into woe is us as much as we relish the greta thunberg blasts and climate warnings and lawyers giving stern takes on how democracies might perish it does reflect a mindset captured by the pet shop boys sac satirical miser miserableism make sure you're always frowning it shows the world you, you always that you've got substance and depth and yeah that's very poignant that's spot on i might have, might have to put that song on after this somehow the conservatives have acquired a key liberal trait and vice versa tories have long been aligned to a view of mankind with roots in sto stoicism and gradual change yet the leap to leave the eu was also a moment when headstrong instinct prevailed over caution 
Liberals, in the British tradition, flourish politically as the Whig Party, embracing institutional and social reform, even when they miscalculated or sometimes failed, as in the Liberal interventions in the early 2000s. The guiding desire was to engage with an evolving world. This did not always make them right, but it did make them a force to be reckoned with in democracies and on the international stage. These days, the general mode of commun communication is a missed sense of being rejected while telling everyone they were right all along and one day you will realise this. Exactly. We know better than you. That is what we've had from... Um, ever since ever since Tony Blair, really, like, since the end of the Blair years, we have had we are better than you instead of what do you want? That's like, Even the Tories aren't... They, they're starting to get it. Like, the Tories got better at it. That's why they've been in power for the past decade. They've always sort of been... D did their own thing, regardless of what the people really thought, whereas Labour was supposed to be, and now they've just totally switched round. It's the Tories that are listening to the, the, the plebs, us, us lot up north in the Midlands, and it's Labour that's listening to their own little bubble inside the M25. Um... I keep thinking back to Joe Swinson's election night speech, which wanted to tell us that she stood by an open, welcoming, inclusive society. So far, so good. But ended up in blaming nationalism for eviscerating her party rather than a poorly thought out Brexit strategy. After a rollicking SNP defeat, we can forgive a bad note or two, but that sourness needs to be dealt with by her successors or anyone with an intention to revive a third force between the far poles of British politics. Hell yes, that was the most uncouth and just horrible speech uh, from Joe Swinson she she basically shit on off on us anybody that voted Tory you're a shit basically like go out with a bit of grace woman for Christ's sake you just lost because of that as well uh, just telling voters that they are the dupes of some vague but regrettable force does not open about does not feel open about why the progressive project is struggling in Britain and beyond. Battered centrists who exist across the parties and beyond them will need to respond to a new political settlement. They may have to bite their tongues of the Prime Minister seeing a changed conservative landscape, boost investments in the north of England and entrenches in political ter territories that the centre-left deemed, in the fond but patrician language of Blairism, our people. Yeah, Boris is going to have to move that way because otherwise Tories won't win the next election. They have lost a bit of support down south, but they have gained a lot in the Midlands. Like, the numbers may be similar in terms of population-wise, but because we're more spread out up here, you still you get more constituencies for less people. So the Tories are they're going to have to put some money into the Midlands, the North, and Wales, all them constituencies that gave them this pretty damn good majority. They they need to look after, otherwise. It won't be long before they go. They've, we've broke the mould now. We're out of our rut of just voting Labour. We don't have to just vote Tory either. Um, the projected reopening of the Newcastle Ashington Blythe railway line to boost deprived towns, isolated by poor infrastructure, will serve as, as a symbolic moment for the Johnson re engagement with northern lands and a useful fillip for more devolution since the idea was hatched locally before the election. Such prospects also offer openings for local people, since they demand attention to the kind of detail and practical decision making that centrists have long cared about. How projects work in practice, the consequences and the opportunities for communities and environmental protections. And yeah, you are spot on there, Anne, because I'm a centrist, I'm not the same centrist as the neoliberals, I am left on the economy and right on social and cultural issues. Which makes me more of a communitarian, but and that that is exactly what I want. Like local local jobs going to local people. That's, why aren't we doing that? Why why do we have to import labour? Why aren't we training our own people to be doing this and then importing people to fill the gaps afterwards instead of leaving our our own people behind? Decentralising will encourage fresh thinking about how to reboot sagging projects such as the city academies for areas outside the metropolis and strategies for public sector revival that go beyond raising spending levels. That is the kind of progress Liberals should hold the government to delivering when the honeymoon is over. To recover relevance, Liberalism needs to change the way it sounds and how it thinks about itself to make the arguments that matter on how societies heal and flourish, the balance of the state and market, and the need to engage voters fully on climate change without alienating them by preaching us. Too many of these arguments will go unheard if the overall tone is self-pity and regret. 
A Greek chorus telling us how awfully the national drama is going will not sell tickets to the great progressive revival. Lesson 1. Cheer up a bit, then figure out how to take on the battle of ideas that still counts. And that last line, yeah, it's quite... You're getting there. They're not quite there, but you're getting there. You do need to cheer up a bit. We are tired of the doom and gloom merchants. That is just driving us nuts at the moment. We don't want any more of that. Um, and also the climate change issue. It's not that necessarily that everybody thinks climate change is made up. It's that we can see the hypocrisy from the people that are asking it from us. Um, you all fly around. You all, there's plenty of people on private jets like Harry and Meghan that are flying around on them and telling us that we should be doing our bit for climate change. We go on probably one holiday a year because that's all we can bloody afford. I don't drive, I walk everywhere or take public transport. I haven't been on a holiday for almost a decade now because I just can't afford it on the on the insecure working hours that I get working for an agency. So get your own house in order first, sort yourselves out before preaching to us on climate change because you're the ones that are causing it you basically your your answer to climate change is money people can still go if they've got money and that that leaves out all of us where, where do we go with that do we have we have to go to skeg for a weekend or blackpool for a weekend because we can't afford to go abroad because you just want to slap money on it you want to make it for the privileged few that are only allowed to fly and that's that's not cricket no we're not having that shit